Bine, v-am găsit la o ediție specială a emisiunii Calea Adevărul și Viața. După cum am promis, lună de lună, pe spațiul acestei emisiuni, vom difuza pentru dumneavoastră o producție specială realizată de partenerii noștri de la Revelation TV, ediție care de obicei este înregistrată cu ajutorul și cu participarea unor membri ai Parlamentului European în Bruxelles. De data aceasta, ediția din această lună a fost înregistrată în Ierusalim. Desigur că cam toate emisiunile abordează perspectiva europeană la nivel politic, la nivel de sus, asupra ceea ce se întâmplă în momentul mijlociu și în întreaga Europa, din, din perspectivă creștină sau iudeo-creștină. Ediția din această săptămână pentru dumneavoastră se adresează celor care vor să-și definească poziția față de Israel și nu numai atât, întreaga discuție este înregistrată în Ierusalim. O să-i revedeți alături de moderatorul Simon Barret, producătorul acestei emisiuni de la Revelation TV, pe doi mai vechi prieteni și ai noștri și ai dumneavoastră, Thomas Sandel, fondatorul și președintele organizației European Coalition for Israel, Coaliția Europeană pentru Israel, și pe prezentatorul cunoscut și drag dumneavoastră și nouă, Chris Mitchell, cel care să până de săptămână este prezent pe ecranele dumneavoastră prin intermediul emisiunii Jerusalem Deadline. Hello and uh, welcome to this very special edition of uh, the European Report. We're not in the European Parliament, we're here at CBN's uh, studios here in Jerusalem and I'm joined by Thomas Sandel, the founder and director of the European Coalition and uh, Chris Mitchell, uh, bureau chief here for CBN. Uh, gentlemen, it's an absolute pleasure to be here in Jerusalem with you both. Um, great to be with you. Two great men of God doing incredible work in really proclaiming the truth of Israel's situation. Thomas working at a very high diplomatic level uh, and Chris, you reaching the world with accurate media reports about Israel's situation. Uh, and Chris, can you share uh, with our viewers that you've won uh, an award from the National Religious Broadcasting for your excellent show, the uh, Jerusalem Dateline, which is which is great news. Yeah, it won an award for the uh, most creative programming and uh, for the National Religious Broadcasters. Uh, interesting story how we actually applied for that. It was my cameraman Jonathan Goff and uh, I were in Erbil, uh, Kurdistan, and, and we finished our application just a few hours before the deadline, but uh, we had to take our 30-minute show and take it down to about 10-minute application, and uh, I guess they appreciate what we do. There's a great team of people here in Jerusalem that, uh, that work to put it together week by week, as well as uh, our assistance from those in uh, Virginia Beach, the headquarters of CBN News, and so uh, it was a real honor, and uh, it's a real blessing uh, to be recognized like that, and, and kind of motivates us to, to do more and uh, tell the story about what's happening here in Israel, Jerusalem, and the Middle East to people around the world. Excellent. Uh, Thomas, uh, you know, it's very rare. I think it's the first time you and I have been in, in Jerusalem and Israel at the mm. same time. Uh, you're here for the uh, Global Forum uh, um, f uh, f conference that is designed to bring the world together, including experts on anti-Semitism uh, and also the Global Prayer Call. Yes, it's it's true, and it's uh, this is how my wh what my life looks like, be it in, in Brussels or Jerusalem. Always very busy, having to go into different meetings at the same time. Um, but it's it's an absolute delight to be here in this studio together with Chris, who's been a, a friend of the coalition for so many years, and I, I still recall how we did the San Remo report together, and yeah. uh, it's it has just been traveling like wildfire around the world. Uh, but the global prayer call is um, a culmination of 100 days of prayer, which started uh, in Auschwitz on the 27th of, um, of January. Um, in the evening, we had, and we mentioned this on the, on the report several times, we had a very special event in the synagogue of, of Krakow uh, with the Jewish community, with the minister of uh, multiculturalism from, from Canada, whom I met, by the way, just... Uh, uh, an hour ago here uh, on the terrace of King David. Um, but um, this is the culmination of those 100 days. So we are here about 500 people from all the continents uh, with this one desire to learn from history and to uh, stand committed with the Jewish people and the state of Israel uh, at the time that we are facing, which we know are, are troubled times. 
the global um, uh, forum against anti-Semitism, which starts in just a few hours, is of course uh, a different aspect of the same mandate to bring together experts and activists uh, on anti-Semitism from, from the whole world. I believe we are about 1,000 delegates uh, just to learn uh, more about this fight and learn from each other and be encouraged by just meeting so many great people from all over the world. So uh, this is a very intense but uh, a very interesting week indeed. Uh, Chris, can you give us a little bit of an update on um, Bibi Netanyahu's coalition? Uh, mm -hmm. We know that he's only got a majority of one, so it's a very fragile coalition. Um, but do you think he'll be strengthened with this new coalition government? And many are fearing, particularly in Europe, that this is a big swing to the right and we're going to see more religious parties having an influence over Israeli policy. Well, it seems like they will because they're part of the coalition and uh, if you understand parliamentary politics uh, and the way a coalition government is set up in the United States, we don't operate on that system, but it's very fragile because it's 120 seats in the Knesset, 61 are in the government, 59 are not. So any one of these several parties that are part of the government, if they decide they want to leave the government, it'll fall and that leads to new elections. So I think uh, it's very fragile. It's, it's just a, uh, a razor edge uh, majority that he has. You know, speaking of prayer, Thomas talked about, uh, you know, global uh, <laughs> call to prayer. And I think a lot of people were praying for the election and a lot of people felt like really Netanyahu, uh, in, in the same way that, that the UK election has uh, uh, shocked people, the polls right there said they were neck and neck, uh, the Labour and, uh, and the Likud party, and he had a majority, about 30 seats, the night of the election. And many people prayed, uh, felt prayer had a role in that, in that election. And now I think people need to pray again that this government is uh, gonna, gonna last. Because Israel's facing you know, major threats, and I think the, the major one of all would be Iran. And they really feel, and some people feel like maybe there should be a national unity government that would be able to present a unified stand against the number one threat of Israel right now, which is an Iran uh, that could get a nuclear weapon. Uh, so it is fragile. It, there is, to your point, uh, the concern that a lot of people have that the religious parties, Shas being one of them, would have an undue influence on the government. That's certainly a possibility uh, because uh, many of these parties are making demands on Netanyahu that they want what they, their agenda, they want their agenda met. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in the next several weeks and several months uh, with Israeli politics. Thomas, we see that many uh, European leaders are very unhappy about the re-election of Bibi Netanyahu. Um, they're certainly very concerned that uh, this Likud government will not push through on the Middle East peace process, despite the fact that the Palestinian leadership themselves have uh, push through a unilateral Palestinian state or certainly trying to do that through the UN and other international bodies which would undermine the legal and political framework of the Oslo, Oslo Accords between the Israelis and the Palestinians. But isn't there a great danger here that in Israel itself, um, particularly with the Israeli public and the Israeli voters, they have not voted a left-wing Labour uh, uh, government in really since um, 1997 with uh, mm -hmm. Hood Barak and the Israeli public now realise that the whole concept of a two-state solution is dead. The Israeli government uh, in your uh, dealings and talks with them mm -hmm. uh, realised that this is not dead. What is it going to take for Europe to realise that this is no longer feasible and this no longer works? I, I, I w <laughs> wish the Europeans were as, as rational as, as you are trying to, to, to indicate uh, could be the case. Uh, s sadly, and we've seen this uh, time and time again, that uh, uh, the two-state solution is a, is a mantra uh, that is being repeated time and time again and, and without e really explaining why this is the ultimate solution. Uh, what we are trying to bring up with the European leaders, and I met with the EU ambassador to Israel just yesterday, um, Ambassador um, uh, Fabog Andersen, and, um, and that is to say that it cannot be that statehood is the ultimate goal. Uh, would we uh, say that people living under Islamic State are happier when and if they would have a caliphate, they would have an Islamic State? Uh, would that be, that be the end of the suffering of those people? No. Um, are we saying that uh, a Palestinian state, which we know would be a, a, a radical Islamic state, would guarantee the values that we are trying to promote in the US and in Europe? No. 
These are very clear-cut issues. And, and therefore, for example, what I brought up uh, in my discussion with the ambassador yesterday is to say, you know, listen, we need a, a different type of benchmarking. Why don't we focus more on the well-being, um, the quality of life mm -hmm. for the Palestinian people? Uh, let's not put them under a new totalitarian uh, regime. And, and while there are no conditions for a viable, uh, call it democratic Palestinian state, let's not pretend that this is the case. So for us, it's a shifting of focus on, on the people rather than, uh, than statehood. You know, and, and Simon, let, this just let me add that, uh, you know, there's, there's a few things. Uh, what, what a Palestinian state would mean, first of all, you divide Jerusalem. And uh, we were just on a tour the other day when much of Jerusalem, the old city, much of the Christian yeah. holy sites would be in a Palestinian state. There's also the danger that Hamas could take over any sort of uh, Palestinian state. They've done that, they did that in Gaza, and they very well could do that in Ramallah. And so these are some of the implications. And in, in addition, if you listen to many of the statements by Palestinian Authority leaders, Mahmoud Abbas, the president, some of the imams there, you know, their goal in many ways, and they state it often very clearly, they want to eliminate the state of Israel. They don't want to necessarily uh, abide, quote unquote, side by side in peace and security. Can, can I just add to, to what I said? Because this is something which was brought up in, in this discussion with the ambassador. And that's also taking a fresh look at Jerusalem, exactly as Chris is saying. Our approach is to say, listen, as Europeans, we believe in certain values. If we divide Jerusalem and Jerusalem again becomes, uh, uh, you know, comes under, uh, not again, but under Arab uh, sovereignty, uh, will this promote the values of, say, religious freedom that we believe in and keep, hold as sacred in Europe? Or, or will it be like it was uh, pre-1967 under a moderate, I should say, a moderate uh, Jordanian regime when Jewish people could not enter the, the old city, they could not pray there, their uh, religious sites were being destroyed. Is, should this be European policy? And I think it's always a matter of reframing the question. So once you uh, present the question this way, of course, no responsible EU leader would say, well, this is what we want to uh, uh, accomplish. But it, uh, it, it starts uh, a process in their minds that maybe they did miss something mm -hmm. in this equation. Yeah. Uh, and, and Chris, we, we've seen that the current leader of uh, the Palestinian Authority, uh, mm -hmm. Abbas, has been in power now for about 10 years, uh, hasn't implemented any elections mm -hmm. uh, in fear that Hamas would actually win a landslide mm -hmm. and take right. over, mm -hmm. which does actually bring in the whole legitimacy of the peace process in the first place. But maybe something that uh, European leaders or even in the US State Department are, looking, are not looking at are the implications of the creation of a Palestinian state state and the impact it have on Jordan. I mean, we know that Jordan at the moment is in a battle of survival against mm -hmm. the rise of the Islamic State. Right. And then with a Palestinian state that under Abbas probably wouldn't last long. Um, so we see the rise of Hamas, which would then lead to a coup d'etat and Hamas taking over, which means that Jordan would then be locked in with Hamas. And we mm -hmm. could see then the radicalization of Jordan's Palestinian population, which is about 70%. So the knock-on effects, not only for Israel, but the entire region, of blindly implementing a Palestinian state just because European leaders, and particularly those that are left, are fed up with this Israeli-Palestinian conflict. What, what's your perspective? Well, like you said, uh, uh, Mahmoud Abbas is in the 10th year of a four-year term. So <laughs> it's been a, been a long time since there's been elections. Uh, and uh, the implications are, uh, it, it's been said that many times it's, it's the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, that are actually keeping Abbas in power right now, mm -hmm. uh, that if they withdrew, then there might be a coup d'etat and Hamas taking over. And then even if, when you look at Hamas, there's actually elements in Gaza, Hebron right now, that are sympathetic to ISIS. And so you could even have a further radicalization here in, uh, in, in the so-called West Bank, and, uh, and that could have more and more implications. About Jordan, we were there uh, several weeks ago, and we, we found a, a dramatic shift that happened in Jordan right after, you know, I'm sure you remember the burning, yes. that, that brutal, barbaric burning of a Jordanian pilot, and uh, that really shifted public opinion in Jordan dramatically. Before that burning, many of them were sort of ambivalent about ISIS. Uh, are they really uh, uh, an enemy that we need to fight? Afterwards, there was really a coalition, a, a coalescing coalition of, of the people in Jordan against ISIS. 
and rallied by King Abdullah. And so I think they're, they're sort of a big shift right now in the Middle East in terms of fighting ISIS and this radical Islam that, that's percolating throughout the region. Yeah. Uh, and Thomas, how, how do we communicate to uh, European political leaders, particularly on the left, who just see the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as completely intractable and that it's time that Israel just concedes a Palestinian state uh, and pushes that through without even looking at what's happening in Palestinian society itself and the implications mm -hmm. of the regional dynamics involved? Yeah. Well, well, first of all, I, I think it's important to clarify, you know, ECI policy on, on the whole issue of Palestinian state. We always say keep the process alive, uh, keep talking. And um, to quote uh, historian Andrew Roberts uh, from, uh, uh, from Northern Ireland and, and uh, famous historian from Cambridge, he said, well, maybe it will take 100 years. So be it. Uh, a state doesn't happen overnight. And what we are saying is let's have an open-ended process and let's not uh, rule out anything. Biblically, of course, you know, we, we don't believe in a, in a two-state solution that is uh, according to, mm -hmm. to the word of God. But I think to be pragmatic and practical, um, and I think that's also with the prime minister, the line that he is following to say, let's, let's keep the discussion uh, going. But, and, and this is our message in Europe as well, and this is to underscore what the Prime Minister said, and he has gotten so much criticism for saying that, that under his watch there will not be a Palestinian state. If he's in power for four years, you know, if, he, if he's lucky. But it makes absolutely sense. Given, and I don't think there's a contradiction in what he said earlier and what he now, uh, you know, said uh, before the elections, because the, uh, the circumstances have changed dramatically in the whole region. It would be suicidal at this point to create a Palestinian state. Anyone understands that. Uh, and I think that London understands it, Washington and Brussels. The point is here also to be pragmatic and say, yes, let's go back to the peace talks. Let's talk to each other, uh, but not to have unrealistic expectations or even a deadline to say, well, let's give 12 months and there should be a Palestinian state. I think that's absolutely uh, foolish. Uh, our next topic of uh, discussion is that of great fears here in uh, Jerusalem about Iran's nuclear ambitions and how this potential Iran deal would allow Iran to have nuclear weapons. Uh, Chris, can you tell us the extent of uh, Israeli public uh, opinion and feelings over the whole issue of this Iran deal, which could and would allow Iran to develop uh, nuclear weapons under the whole umbrella of, of the Western world? Well, I think both the politicians, uh, yeah, actually throughout the political spectrum and many of the uh, people on the street uh, feel the same way, that they see Iran as the number one threat. I was talking to mm -hmm. an official uh, yesterday in a, in a certain organization where he said that, uh, you know, people aren't worried about ISIS coming down the streets here in Jerusalem. They are concerned about a nuclear Iran. And I think they would agree with Benjamin Netanyahu who said, you know, this, uh, this not only, uh, it paves the way for a nuclear bomb by Iran because it gives, uh, first of all, legitimacy that Iran can uh, enrich some uranium. And it's so many loopholes in it that it looks like uh, it would, they'd be right on the threshold of, uh, of achieving what they have done for uh, more than a decade now, trying to get a nuclear weapon. And so I think they are very concerned about this deal uh, coming up, I guess, uh, at the end of June, mm -hmm. uh, suppose. And that's the latest deadline. Who knows if they're going to extend the deadline one more time. Mm -hmm. But what that does, the discussions, uh, you know, keep allowing Iran to uh, spin their centrifuges and enrich uranium and get closer and closer to not only a nuclear weapon, but also their missile program is something that a lot of people, and that's not even addressed in these negotiations. They have a robust uh, ballistic missile program that could send an atomic weapon not only to Europe, but to the east coast of uh, um, the United States. And, and, and their rhetoric continues. They still consider that Israel is the little Satan, the United States is the great Satan, and, uh, and so their, their motivation, their ideology is just pushing them towards uh, more and more closer to a nuclear weapon. Uh, Thomas, we've seen real cooperation, particularly between the uh, EU and uh, also with the US uh, State Department on the Iranian nuclear mm -hmm. talks and negotiations. But it, it's my impression that they're more interested in having a deal and they can claim some sort of diplomatic 
victory for engaging with Iran. Do you think that our European leaders are are being deceived that they are not they're more interested in getting an agreement rather than actually preventing Iran from having nuclear weapons? I think the problem we, we have in Europe today and in the West as uh, at, at large is that um, uh, the courage that a uh, person like Winston Churchill had is, is not to be found. And I think uh, the Israeli Prime Minister would probably be the only exception as far as I can see. Uh, because I think it's, it's in our psyche always to avoid a confrontation as much as we can. And um, if we have a number of um, expert opinions, we prefer to listen to those who would uh, uh, support this view. Uh, and uh, because I always made this point to say that there shouldn't be negotiations with Iran in the first place as long as uh, one UN member state has as its uh, stated goal to eliminate another UN member state. This is completely against the spirit and uh, the, the word of international law. And, um, and we know that it was brought up uh, by the Israelis uh, with the White House and uh, I think it was uh, John Kerry who said that, you know, let's not get complicated, this is not on the agenda. And I think that's completely disgraceful that, that you know, they would brush away this, uh, which is the real DNA of the, the current uh, regime in Iran. Let me also finish to say that, um, as Chris uh, indicated, that um, the deadline being the 30th of, of June um, and uh, site for, for signing a possible uh, agreement is again in Europe. Uh, in Lausanne, in Switzerland. And it reminds me also about how we historically as Christians have failed the Jewish people so many times. We often speak about the Evian Conference in 1938 and are surprised that no Christians spoke up. Uh, again, I, I hope and I wish that there will be Christians in Lausanne who mm. will pray and people will pray elsewhere, but also that there will be statements made on the record to say that, you know, the dangers of this deal, to say this is a bad deal. Um, and and uh, as a coalition, we'll hope to, to be there and to have a voice, which I believe is so important. Mm. And Simon, you know, I think it really is a, d a decision between deception or diplomacy. Mm. And I'm reminded that uh, the current president of Iran, Rouhani, was the chief uh, nuclear negotiator back in the, uh, about 10 years ago, and he boasted that he was able to delay uh, the negotiations long enough for them to establish their uh, uh, nuclear plant in Natanz. And so I think that's the same thing that's going on, this delay in diplomacy to allow them continue to go on. What I find surprising, though, is the way that uh, the US President Obama's pushing through with this agreement without looking at the fine print. It, it, and he's also looking for a legacy, isn't he? I mean, President Obama has probably mm -hmm. yet less than a, a year and a half in, right. in office. And in terms of foreign policy, he, he can't look back at anything he can say he's achieved. So I, is he wanting to create this deal as a legacy and to normalize relations between Iran and say this is a major triumph for diplomacy and reason over force from his uh, predecessor, Bush? I think it's both. I think he's, uh, he is looking for a legacy and I also think he sees the Middle East as if he can get Iran and sort of the Shiite Iran uh, sort of paired against the Sunni uh, nations like Saudi Arabia and Egypt that there'll be some sort of uh, balance in the Middle East. I think just, just the contrary is happening. Uh, many of these Arab states like Egypt and Saudi Arabia, some of the Gulf Arab states are terrified of in a, a nuclear Iran. And so they themselves are arming and there's actually some sort of an unspoken alliance between Egypt, Israel, Saudi Arabia that they will stand uh, together in, to some degree against uh, an Iranian nuclear uh, program. And so I think uh, Obama's uh, attempt to, you know, sort of bring Iran into the family of nations, I think, is having a disastrous effect on the whole region. Uh, and uh, Thomas, we, we see that uh, the Israeli Prime Minister here in Jerusalem is one of the very few Western leaders that uh, are willing to call a spade a spade and to warn about the dangers of this Iranian nuclear deal that doesn't stop Iran enriching uranium. It doesn't deal with Iran's um, inter-ballistic continental missiles, doesn't stop Iran's abuse for human rights inside Iran mm -hmm. and the Middle East, and also doesn't stop their support for terrorist organizations mm -hmm. like Hezbollah and other uh, Islamic terror cells across the world. Mm. 
Um, absolutely, and and um, again, I think we have real leadership problems both in Washington and and Europe, and. Um, I'm just uh, thinking back, as, as you were speaking with uh, Chris earlier, uh, we were in New York uh, when there was this, uh, uh, w w where there was a new uh, season of relationships with Iran when, when I think Rouhani was for the first time invited to speak with the US administration. Mm -hmm. And, and um, uh, sometimes it's interesting to, to look back and just as a believer sense the the atmosphere, because they had taken a whole hotel in New York, which was uh, absolutely the, the tightest security, uh, security you could have. And, and somehow we were able to get in uh, together with a friend and to pray in that mm -hmm. hotel. But my friend and what I experienced myself was just the strangest, weirdest sense of spiritual darkness that you can imagine. It's like you could cut with a knife just being there. And, and, um, and I think this is um, obviously a dimension that uh, politi secular political leaders cannot have an understanding of. But I've been speaking with people from the old generation in Europe. One in particular, he said, yes, my father met with Hitler. This is what he told me he was like. And it was a very similar experience of, of, of just sensing that something was very strange, was very wrong, was very dark. Mm -hmm. And, and I think also as Christians, this is something that we need to, to put on the table. And, and obviously, this is not a rational argument, but something we can deal with only, only in prayer. Mm. So we as ECI, yes, we have an obligation to raise these issues, which uh, Chris has also highlighted to the European leaders. But, but obviously, this is a, a battle which has to be fought on a completely different levels. And there, I think our viewers, you know, if you're a Christian believer, you are just as powerful as any Barack yeah. Obama or, or any <laughs> European leader. Simon, it reminds me of uh, the book of Daniel. You know, there was, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the book of Esther, yeah. when Haman wanted to destroy the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And it's like that same spirit of Haman, whether it's Nazi yeah. Germany yeah. or the Iran regime right now, it, they're seeking to destroy God's chosen people. Yes. And prayer is the main weapon yeah. against that. No, I, I absolutely. But what is the knock-on impact on uh, Israeli-U.S. relations? Because uh, in terms of Israel's security, and from the very founding of the State of Israel, when uh, David Ben-Gurion was Israel's first Prime Minister, he realized that for Israel's security, uh, uh, Israel had to line herself with a world superpower, yeah. and he chose the United States. And the United States has been a, such a strong supporter of Israel. And yet today, under the Obama administration, we see a crisis crisis in the relationship between Israel and the United States. What is the reason for this and what are the dangers for Israel's security if this continues? Well, I know many people see, you know, the relationship with the United States as the number one asset for uh, the foreign policy, for the defense policy mm -hmm. of the state of Israel. And yet I think the crisis has come because uh, there's a diametrically opposed views between President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu, mm -hmm. and mainly concerning the Iran nuclear program, mm -hmm. where Obama seems to want to appease Iran and its nuclear program. Netanyahu sees that as an existential threat against the state of Israel, and I think he's made the calculated decision, I need to stand with the Jewish people, mm -hmm. and regardless of what the United States, they may be the world's superpower, but uh, he believes deeply in his heart, I believe, they're wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they're gonna d endanger Israel. And so I think uh, he's, he's uh, put, put, I guess, balance the scales. I mean, do I, do I stand with the Jewish people or do I sort of stand with uh, the world superpower? And I think he's made his decision to be an advocate for the Jewish people. We had the opportunity a, a few years ago to be up in Moscow with Prime Minister Netanyahu on his trip to see Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. There was a background briefing, uh, it was off the record except for one question. I had the uh, opportunity to ask this question, is did he feel like he was like Netanyahu back in, the back in Churchill, back in the 1930s? Did he see a similarity between his role and Churchill's roles? And he did. And he felt like a, a sort of a voice in the wilderness mm -hmm. and that he felt his duty and responsibility to stand with the Jewish people and preserve their legacy uh, for such a time as this. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Um, Chris uh, and also uh, Thomas, thank you so much for allowing us to record uh, a European report in your amazing studios here in, in Jerusalem. So thank you so much. And it's been a, a pleasure to uh, have you both on the program today. Great to be with you, Simon. 
And I uh, just want to thank you uh, for watching today's program. I think what it shows us that uh, when we're here in Jerusalem, you have a better perspective of the threats facing Israel, but also the threats facing the Christian communities in the Middle East. And so we have to stand on the right side of history. And we can do that by supporting Israel, supporting the Jewish people, but also supporting our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who are suffering with the rise of the Islamic State in the Middle East.